Oh, you are saying if I do First, I realize a few people are joining remotely, so I'll, I'll try to write a okay. okay, so today I'm very happy to uh, be here to be talking about this project that we put out a week ago with Eric Pomler at CEA SACLE. Um, and to this group in particular. Um, so the, the goal of this talk and of this project is to extract the physical consequences of S-duality for N equals four supreme mills. Um, and along the way, we'll see that there's some interesting consequences of that. So just some introductory remarks, at, you know, at the risk of stating a tautology, obviously N equals four supreme mills is a very beautiful theory from a theory of perspectives. You know, it's a maximally supersymmetric gauge theory. So there's a very rigid structure to the CFT data. Um, and over the decades, it's been studied from a wide variety of approaches. Uh, at finite M, there's perturbation theory, which has been complemented in recent years by uh, the modern conformal bootstrap techniques. Uh, for supersymmetric observables, you have localization. And at large N, there are new symmetries, and you have access to integrability and the like. And of course, via the duality with type 2B string theory on ADS5 times S5, it furnishes our most robust and explicit definition of non perturbative quantum gravity. But important for the purposes of this talk is that it enjoys S duality. So N equals four has a complexified coupling tau. So tau, the, the real part of tau is the topological theta angle of the gauge theory, and the imaginary part is related to the, the gauge coupling, the gauge theory. Um, now, this, this is a coordinate on a one complex dimensional moduli space that n equals four lives on. Um, and it, it's, uh, sorry, one complex dimensional moduli space that preserves the full n equals four as supersymmetry. And the statement of S duality, is that CFT observables which throughout this talk I'll denote abstractly by O of tau so I'm not referring to an operator here O is the general observable non-perturbatively well-defined observable n equals four I'm suppressing all other labels that it may may carry like cross ratios dimensions things like that um, it depends non-holomorphically on this complexified coupling 
And the statement of S duality is that observables are invariant under SL2Z transformations of the complex collection. There's some caveats for extended observables, but throughout the talk, I'll be considering uh, observables that can be built out of local. This is the local operator, also the transform of some ways. Well, I, I, I suppose let me restrict my attention to observables which are invariant. If they do transform with covariantly under SL2Z, we can accommodate those by uh, in a systematic way. Um, so let me restrict my attention to observables that are invariant. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that this symmetry hasn't really been fully taken advantage of in N equals four. In particular, the bootstrap has not really incorporated S duality uh, systematically. And in practice, uh, I would say that there's very little real world information about the modular structure of CFT observables uh, viewed as a, a function of the complexified coupling. Of course, you can do perturbation theory and S duality relates strong and weak coupling, but really this is an inherently non-perturbative uh, duality. So the idea of this project was simply to bake in modular invariants from the outset. And this is facilitated by a robust mathematical theory of uh, harmonic analysis on the fundamental domain of SL2Z. So this will be our main tool. Um, and so the idea is to um, expand CFT observables O in a complete basis of uh, functions which are themselves modular invariant. Um, and then all the dynamical information about the observable is encoded in its spectral overlaps and modular invariance is completely manifest. Um, and this is definitely like a rather different presentation of observables than one normally encounters in N equals four. Um, but essentially for that reason, uh, we'll see that relatively simple calculations will lead to a wealth of interesting consequences, both for the structure of perturbation theory and for the instant time expansion. And we'll see that the structure is especially rigid in the large N, uh, in the large N limit with uh, fixed tough coupling. And we'll see in particular that SL2Z invariants will imply the existence of certain non perturbative effects, both at large N and in the strongly coupled region where lambda becomes large. Now, um, the, strong the strongly coupled region is interesting uh, for another reason. Uh, famously, N equals four is dual to type 2B supergravity on ADS5 times S5 with a prescribed set of uh, stringing corrections. Um, and remarkably, or at least surprisingly to us, S-duality had something to say about this. In particular, we found is that the strong coupling limit of an observable in the planar theory is equal to its ensemble average in a sense that I'll describe shortly over the conformal manifold. So this is, the supergravity value, call it the supra of the observable, its value in type 2b supergravity on ADS5 times S5. And this is its ensemble average over the conformal manifold with respect to the measure inherited from the Zamologic metric on moduli space. Um, and we call this the SL2Z ensemble. The right hand side depends on n. Do you take it, but the left hand side doesn't? I should say at large n. So the large n limit of the average. So there's a leading term at large n, and that's what captures the strongly coupled physics on the left hand side. Where, where is the tau dependence here, or is it or is this the, the average averages over tau? Well, the average completely obscures the tau dependence that goes away. And similarly, on the left hand side, I, I've taken the atuf limit and then sent lambda to infinity after sending it to infinity. Are there any other questions before I move on? Okay, um, so the, the slogan is that uh, this leads to 
uh, and emergent average holographic duality within string theory. Um, and this is in intriguing and confusing. And I, I think it's fair to say that we don't fully understand all of the consequences of this. And, and we'll discuss some of those today. Um, so yeah, um, that's the basic sketch. I'm sorry. Oh, is O a local operator? No, no. O is meant to denote an abstract observable that is that invariant under S duality and, and equals so four. Can, can I have in mind O being a string of operators at different points? Well, uh, for example, one such uh, observable we'll consider is an integrated uh, four-point function of local operators. You could also consider unintegrated correlation functions, but that would be fine as long as it is invariant under SL2C and, and is not perturbatively well-defined across the conformal manifold. So when you, you if you consider correlation functions at separated points, when, when do you average over tau? When? So Under imagine you, you, you had the exact answer. So you would have some function of tau and some positions. And yeah. then do you take this answer and you average it over tau? Yes, yes. That's the idea. And, we'll the, and the answer would still be function of the positions. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I've suppressed all the other labels that O may carry here, like cross ratios, positions, dimensions things of that nature. And will the answer be local then? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a good intuition actually for whether the average answer need be local. I, I would think so, but to be honest, the, the observables we've been able to study very concretely are integrated. And so they, they don't carry any other labels. Um, so, you know, things like that are completely obscured if they're very coarse grained observables. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't studied unintegrated correlators explicitly. Thank you. So, but I guess they are as local as the gravity answer, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the, at least the claim of, at large M anyway, uh, that's the claim of that duality. Yes. I'm, I'm a bit confused about the words emergent average holographic duality because yeah. even if I consider the stress tensor multiplet, the super conformal primary is SL2Z invariant, but the other operators, most of the other operators in the multiple transform as modular forms under SL2Z. So okay. they would not fall under this category. And for them, I don't know what it would mean. They, they, could, they, they could, and you would have to redefine the observable to take into account the, the, the weight under SL2Z, but they, I think they could be accommodated in the spring. So, so that's how you would deal with yeah, yeah, that's how I would deal with things that transform covariant with some definite weight. Okay, uh, thanks for all the questions. Um, let's get started. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I'll start, as I said, by describing the SL2Z spectral theory. Um, so of course, one of the statements of S duality is the statement that the complexified coupling tau should really be thought of as living not on the upper half plane, but in the fundamental domain of SL2Z. So I'm going to denote its real and imaginary parts by x and y, respectively, where I recall x is the theta angle and y is the pH coupling. Um, so there's a natural metric on this space, uh, which is just the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane, and it comes equipped with a Laplacian. Now, there's a natural inner product on this space known as the Peterson inner product. For two functions, f and g, defined on the fundamental domain, I simply integrate them over the fundamental domain with the SL2R invariant measure. 
at the tau and the compost up here, which is tau. So the basic idea is to decompose these CFT observables I've written abstractly as O into a complete basis of eigenfunctions of this Laplacian using this inner product and the fact that the Laplacian is self-adjoint with respect to that inner product. Um, so this is possible when the observable O has finite norm with respect to that inner product. And so the, the, the paper with Eric was building on we, we use similar technology in a paper over the summer in the context of 2D CFT partition functions. And there, this, uh, this property was not obeyed. Um, but I think it's rather natural in N equals four because on general principles, observables are finite in the interior of moduli space, and you just have to worry about the boundaries. But at the cost, it's how it goes to I infinity. That's just the free one. So at the cusp, um, such observables just converge to their value of the free theory. So uh, generically, CFT observables O fit it nicely into this framework. Um, so there's a complete basis of such eigenfunctions. Which I'll describe uh, now. Um, there is the constant function, of course. as eigenvalue zero under the action of the Laplacian. Next, it's a bit more interesting, uh, but still uh, kind of under control, is a continuous branch spanned by the so-called real analytic Eisenstein series. Um, and these have the following eigenvalue under the action of the Laplacian. And their delta function normalizable and are part of the basis when S is on this critical one. No part of S equals a half. Now, it'll be important uh, in what follows uh, at a technical level that these functions can be realized as a Poincare series, a sum over images of the modular group, some power imaginary part of tau. And this converges provided the real part of S is sufficiently large. Um, however, they also admit a meromorphic continuation to the entire uh, complex S plane. So there's a zero mode. And there are higher modes. I'm doing the Fourier decomposition with respect to the real part of tau. So only a couple of things to note here. First, you can think of the Fourier decomposition because X is the theta angle of the gauge theory as grading by the total instanton charge. Um, so the zero mode here is purely perturbative in the weak coupling limit. Remember Y is one over G squared. So Y goes to infinity is the weak coupling limit. Um, and the higher modes are uh, Non perturbatively suppressed that we couple in. Um, so here I've introduced this funny capital lambda function. It will also play a role in what follows. It, it's a completed version of the Riemann zeta function uh, that satisfies a nice uh, functional equation, which is just that of the zeta function. And finally, uh, Although I haven't written it out explicitly, it's clear from the Fourier decomposition that the Eisenstein series, when I multiply by this funny lambda function, also satisfies a functional equation. And that will also play a role. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so in addition to the uh, continuous branch, there's an infinite discrete branch of so-called MOS cusp forms. Um, so these have the following. 
following eigenvalue under the action of the Laplace. Here, the Tn is a set of sporadic positive real numbers that, um, in principle, have to be determined by a sort of bootstrap like algorithm. Uh, so for a small n, you can compute them numerically to a high level of precision. And for big n, you have to rely on statistical properties that these things turn out to satisfy. Um, so this branch is much more wild and mysterious. Um, functionally, they look quite similar to the Eisenstein series. So let's write out the Fourier decomposition. So here's the eigenvalue that appears here. And there's also this, four, this series of Fourier coefficients here. Um, and both the set of eigenvalues, Tn, and the set of Fourier coefficients are of great interest to mathematicians. Um, and they, uh, there, there are many uh, rigorously pro proven results and conjectures about their statistical properties. This is a field of research that goes under the general name of arithmetic chaos, which is reflecting the fact that um, these cusp forms are related to the energy eigenstates of a particle <coughs> propagating on the fundamental domain on the modular surface. And this is a classically chaotic system. There's a lot more that could be said about that, but I'll keep it at that. Um, so let's return to CFT observables. They again also admit a Fourier decomposition, writing by the total instanton chart. Again, O0 is the zero mode, these are the higher modes. Um, and the, the the statement of this uh, spectral theory is that such CFT observables admit a unique decomposition into the spaces. So there's a constant. There's this continuous branch, the Eisenstein series. And there's this infinite discrete branch stated by the cusp forms. And already there are a few comments to be made about uh, each of the pieces in this decomposition. Let's start with this one, the Eisenstein overlap. Now, this Eisenstein overlap, OES, it turns out that because the Eisenstein series is a Poincare series, this is the whole reason I wrote that equation down uh, earlier. There's a neat unfolding trick you can do to unfold the uh, Peterson inner product as an integral over the fundamental domain to one over the strip. And that, what that ends up giving you is a Mellon transform of the zero mode. So this Eisenstein overlap is fixed entirely by the zero mode of the CFT observable. It also uh, being, uh, an inner product with the Eisenstein series inherits uh, many of the analytic properties of the Eisenstein series in the complex S plane. So, for example, I can define this modified overlap with the curly brackets, which is just defined by dividing by, again, the funny lambda function. And this satisfies a functional equation. Okay, so another uh, interesting element of this decomposition here is the constant term, which I call O bar. Now O bar is just the overlap of the, of the observable with the constant, with one. Um, so this can be written in terms of what we call the modular average. Of O. 
over the fundamental domain with respect to the Poincaré measure. And it's a non-trivial fact due to maximal supersymmetry, essentially, that this is also equal to the ensemble average of the observable O over the conformal manifold. And the reason for that is because uh, essentially due to maximal supersymmetry, the metric inherited from the Zamo the measure inherited from the Zamologikov metric is just the Poincaré metric. Um, and so the modular average, oh, modular average is the ensemble average. Where the ensemble is defined by averaging over the conformal manifold. Maybe you said that, but can you clarify why this should be expected? A priori, it, it shouldn't be expected. And if you consider deformations of n equals four, like for example, uh, 40 n equals two QCD, there will still be some remnant action of the SL2Z on the theory, but the, the Zamologikov metric is not the Poincaré metric. It's some more complicated observable or some more complicated metric that uh, has to be computed. But why should there be such an average in the first place? Uh, well, a priori, there doesn't have to be. But um, it, in recent years, uh, you know, it's one thing uh, that low dimensional holographic dualities is sometimes it's not totally crazy to consider averages over uh, conformal manifolds. It seems to me there's a naive reason for what you're saying, which is the following. You take large n with fixed tau, or fixed g squared, let's say, but then g squared n is generically large, which puts you in the supergravity region. And that's a very heuristic way of thinking about our main result, indeed. And the content of the project is to make that idea a little bit more precise. I don't understand the end of Edward's comment. In what way does this explain why it should be an average? Oh, it, it, that, I, I think the previous comment had more to do with the large n average being related to the supergravity value. Um, this here is just, um, uh, just telling you that the constant term in the spectral decomposition of the CFT observable may be interpreted as the average of the observable over the conformal manifold. It's not meant to be uh, controversial. Well, what I meant though was simply the following. Um, if n is large, then for a random g squared, g squared n is large. So exactly. when you're averaging over a tau with the usual modular measure, every point there is at large g squared n when, g, when n is large enough. Indeed. And that's, I think, a, a reasonable heuristic for thinking about the main result about averaging and supergravity. Are there any other comments before I move on? OK. Um, another upshot of this decomposition is that instanton physics is highly redundant. Um, in the sense that um, SL2Z invariance intertwines the various uh, Fourier modes, the various instanton sectors. So in, let's consider a simplified setting where it, the overlap with the cusps vanishes. This will be the case in some observables we'll study. Um, in that case, then, if you have somehow access to the zero mode. A brief comment. Yeah. So your boxed equation, presumably you have a version of that also in the large and finite tablet. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's very strongly called on with it. Because then in that limit, though, there's no relation between n and tau. So there's no kind of naive intuition of why they should, why you should have the average over tau. Yeah, so what Shai is saying is that the supergravity uh, observable can also be obtained from the strongly coupled, very strongly coupled limit where you take n to infinity but fix the coupling and then send the coupling to the cusp to zero. Um, and yeah, I'm. There may be a schematic way of thinking about it in, on those terms, but I haven't thought very carefully about it. 
Okay, so anyway, in, in this setting, you have the zero mode. You can use that to compute the Eisenstein overlap. And then that, in turn, you can use to compute the kth Fourier mode just by integrating it against that of the Eisenstein series. So this is just a cartoon to illustrate the idea that uh, a consequence of SL2Z invariance is that instanton physics is redundant. Okay, um, moving on. So I've said the word CFT observable a lot already. Um, it might not be clear what I mean by that. Um, and what I mean when I say CFT observable, what I have in mind is something that is not perturbatively well defined across the whole manifold question. So, for example, you could speak of, sorry. Yep. Uh, can you comment again um, from the intuition just provided why it shouldn't work for n equals 2 to theory? Why it should work? Yeah. For n equals 2? Yeah. It wouldn't because the Zemologikov metric is different from the Poincare metric. It would be interpreted rather as an automorphic average instead of a. I guess you, you could do a harmonic analysis. Yeah. yeah. You could. You could. You could. If it's available, you you you, you for sure could. Uh, but yeah, the, all I mean is the story would be a little bit different. In, Even at large n, I guess. Sorry. Even if you take the large n. Yes. Then in this case, yeah. Or at least the interpretation of the right hand side would definitely be different. It would not be interpreted as an average over the conformal manifold. Have we shown when, when we expect that O phi n is zero? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And we, we don't a priori have a good uh, heuristic for determining that. The, the thing I'm about to describe has this property. We studied another integrated correlator in the paper that does not have that property. I, I'm not sure if it's related to the amount of supersymmetry preserved by the observable or not. We, we haven't been able to determine that, but that, that may be the case. Uh, but a priori, yeah, I don't have a good idea for what kinds of observables have uh, O phi n equal to zero. I mean, these are very erratic random objects, so you might want to associate them with some form of chaos. But making that precise is a challenge. Yes. Is there a sense why you have you need to somehow put in the assumption that it's holographic at the, at the large end when you put two theories? Or um, I'm not sure. We, we haven't thought very much about uh, the 48 equals two theories, to be honest. Uh, the discussion today is entirely about n equals four. But it's on our to-do list, so I'd be happy to talk more about it. Let's see, the finance have only instant on contribution? Yeah, yeah, there's no zero mod. That's right. That's an important feature. Okay, um, so I wanna talk about, um, one sort of beautiful example uh, of an observable that we do have access to over the conformal manifold, and in fact, for all values of n conjecturally. Um, and this is uh, the integrated correlator. It's an integrated stress tensor multiplet four point function, integrated with respect to some measure that preserves supersymmetry over Euclidean space. I believe this was first introduced in a paper by Sylvia Shai and Damon and Yifan um, in 2019. Um, so this observable, which we call GN of tau, um, it can also be obtained as a derivative of a mass deformed sphere free energy from localization. Um, and kind of um, amazingly, uh, in a what I think is a very beautiful paper by Dora Goni, Green, and Wen from last year, um, there's a conjectured expression for this thing for all n and tau. It takes the form of a two dimensional lattice sum over a one dimensional integral. So here, bn of c is a rational function whose, uh, the the, for which the degree of polynomials in the numerator and denominator are set by n. And there's some simple function that carries the This is uh, S2L. 
Um, they also provided another uh, somewhat more formal representation of it as an infinite sum over Eisenstein series. So there are a few elements of these decompositions that um, we will be able to provide some physical uh, interpretation of. So here there's this kernel, uh, which we'll return to later. There's this constant term in the infinite Eisenstein sum, and there are these coefficients. Um, and in particular for SU2, n equals two cor uh, correlator, uh, it takes a particularly simple form. Uh, so in our paper, we claim that this is given exactly by the following uh, spectral decomposition. So gn of tau is equal to n n minus one over four. This is the constant term. So how do we interpret these terms? The first is the average over the conformal manifold. The second here, you see we pulled the, these coefficients that appeared in the infinite sum there back to the critical line and dress them with some factors that give them poles at integer values of s. Uh, so this is the Eisenstein overlap. And in particular, the cusp form overlap vanishes. Oh, yeah, the approximately equal to. Yeah, yeah. I, I say approx. Actually, it's already clear. I think from this representation of it, why I say approximately. The reason is that this is a kind of formal sum that doesn't converge everywhere for all values in half. It, you can actually see that because it can be obtained from this representation by contour deformation. But the coefficient uh, doesn't decay at infinity, um, so that's why I say it's formal and put the approximate sign there. Okay, so in, in what follows, we'll, we'll see that this follows rather naturally from general constraints from both SL2Z invariance and the well-definedness of perturbation theory. Are there any questions about that? Okay, um, so let's develop perturbation theory in G angle squared. So small weak coupling is large Y. So let's look at the zero mode, for example. It's given by the average plus the Eisenstein part. This is just the zero mode of the Eisenstein series that I wrote down earlier. Now, what? You, so the way that one imagines develop, developing perturbation theory is by deforming this uh, spectral contour in the appropriate direction for each term uh, to develop a series expansion in powers of one over y. Now, you might uh, reasonably complain that I don't know that that's allowed because I haven't said, said how this combination grows as you take s to plus or minus infinity. Now, that's a valid complaint. Uh, but what we'll see is that the growth of these coefficients encode whether the perturbative series is convergent, asymptotic, Borel summable, or not Borel summable. And so there's some physics there. So anyway, the, the upshot of the of perturbation theory is that uh, this expansion has to proceed in integer powers of one over y, and there can't be any uh, logarithms or anything like that. So that turns out to highly uh, constrain the most general form of the uh, spectral overlap, OES. So I claim that it takes the following form. Here's a factor that provides uh, uh, poles at the integers. 
is a function, which I suggestively called FP. And there's a regular part, which I call FNP. Um, so the role in life of this thing is to develop perturbative terms in the weak coupling limit. So these give powers of one over Y. While what this thing does for a living is to generate non-perturbative terms, instanton, anti-instanton terms, like QQ bar, which is e to the minus four pi Y to some integer power. Now I haven't told you anything about these functions F. Um, they're, they satisfy the reflection property because this thing has to. So they're invariant under S to one minus S. Uh, they have satisfied nice reality properties and they're regular basically everywhere in the S plane. Um, you might wonder why I've uh, canceled the pole at S equals one and S equals zero here. Uh, and the reason is that the Eisenstein series itself is singular at S equals one. So if there was an additional pole that would lead to a non-analyticity, uh, it turns out. Uh, and this uh, discussion I think reveals the optimal simplicity of the n equals two integrated correlator. Uh, so we saw earlier that it's overlap with the cusp spanishes, uh, but also here we see that it's uh, non-perturbative part vanishes and it's, uh, and the perturbative part is in a precise sense, the simplest thing it could be. Um, I, I didn't say this in words, but the overlap also has to vanish at S equals a half, which is also a property inherited from the Eisenstein series. Um, so this is really the simplest thing you could imagine having that's consistent both with perturbation theory and SL2C invariance. So this, this, these integrated correlators are really uh, very special objects in the space of N equals four observables. The fact that the non-perturbative part vanishes, is that just for G2 or for any GN? For all, all, it's for all GN, for all SUN. Uh, for the other integrated correlator that we consider in the paper, that's not the case, but I, I won't uh, discuss that explicitly. So more generally, moving beyond this uh, particular integrated correlator I discussed over there, um, it's often the case that in N equals four, uh, Observables have Borel summable perturbative series. So, in particular, you can imagine computing the zero mode and looking at its perturbative series. It's some formal power series in one over y. And we see from this discussion that we can relate Cn to the FPs over there. So if this, is, if this series is asymptotic, then suppose at large n, uh, Cn grows factorially, but has some subleading exponential behavior for some r. Then uh, now remember this funny lambda function included a gamma, is roughly gamma times zeta. Um, and so that itself grows factorially. And that means that f uh, falls off like r to the minus n at large n. So you can define what we did in the paper was introduced a so-called SL2Z Borel transform, which takes into account the structure of SL2Z invariant perturbation theory. And I define it simply by dividing the coefficients by this, instead of a gamma function, by this funny lambda function. Uh, and if the asymptotic behavior of the coefficients is like this, then this has radius of convergence R. And from this um, uh, SL2Z Borel transform, you can obtain the resummation by inverting uh, this transform. So there's some integral. Uh, inverts the action of these lambdas involving the elliptic theta functions. Anyway, as usual, it's some integral of the Borel transform on the real line. 
Now, okay, now I'm in trouble. Um, so when the overlap with the cusps vanishes, then you can reconstruct the full observable from the zero mode in an elegant way. That's clear already from what I've described, but you can do something else. You consider summing the zero mode over SL2Z images. And what you get is precisely a lattice integral representation like the uh, integrated correlator was endowed with. But now for a rather general class of CFT observables. And moreover, it gives a uh, physical content to the kernel of the integral of the lattice integral representation as the SL2Z Borel transform of the zero mode. Are there any questions before I move to large n? Could you say again what the difference is between this and what you were talking about before? Uh, which part of what I was talking about before? Here on the left blackboard? Yeah. That's just the result that they had, the green and dark had. Uh, this is a general class of observables. It's any any uh, observable for which the overlap with the cusps, cusps vanishes. That includes the uh, that includes the integrated four-point function that I was discussing, but it's more general than that. Okay. And what we see is that there's a this class of observables has a similar lattice integral representation where the kernel is interpreted as the parallel transform. So the only difference is the function B of set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can discuss this later, but um, the special decomposition you introduced, uh, is it like unique in some sense? Because like, you know, could there be, let's so say for the other integrated constraint, the four derivatives of mass one, which involves like generalized yep. Einstein, could you have a special decomposition whose basis elements are generalized Einstein, and then maybe in that basis, it would have no non-derivative terms? Like, I'm just wondering like, if you know, for different quantities, there might be a different down. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't think so. I think the spectral decomposition is unique within that class. Of course, you can, to form the basis, I suppose, if you want. Uh, and we were able to make sense of these generalized Eisensteins within, at least in the, you know, the, these funny functions that appear in the large n expansion. Uh, we, we, we were able to accommodate them within this framework, but uh, yeah, they were, they were nasty. Yeah, the problem is in this framework, you have those horrible models. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I, I will say, I, I'm, I've been made aware that there's some ongoing work by Doragoni et al. Uh, looking at the other integrated correlator at finite n. Oh, um, so okay. oh, do you think they they have? A, they may have some. I, I mean, I'm sure it's probably not something nice like this, but they apparently uh, have some new results on the other integrated correlator at finite n, which may shed some light on how to think about it. Okay, let's finally get to large n. Um, so throughout the talk, I will exclusively be considered uh, concerned with the ATF component. And it's n to infinity, let's say lambda. Then the perturbative one over n expansion famously organizes into a genus expansion. We're only going to look at the zero mode because the higher instant time modes are non-perturbatively suppressed in the atop limit. Um, this organizes into a genus expansion. All right, every order in the genus expansion, you have some function of lambda. Um, 
So then the name of the game is just to study the one over n expansion of the spectral overlaps. Uh, so for example, uh, you can look at the perturbative part, and it turns out that it has the rather general form S plus ordinary to reflection to maintain the reflection symmetry. This isn't obvious from anything I've said so far, but it follows from the general scaling argument and the fact that the overlap is determined as a Mellon transform. Um, so in what follows, just for the simplicity of the presentation, I'm going to set the non-perturbative parts to zero. Um, they can be restored, and basically they don't alter the conceptual picture that will emerge, uh, and we do it carefully, and we treat it carefully in the paper, but for now I'm just going to set FNP to zero. Um, so then we can play the exact same game as we played at finite n. Uh, so we can uh, insert this into the spectral decomposition, uh, now viewed as a function of n and lambda, and develop the perturbation theory either at weak coupling or at strong coupling. So at weak coupling, this is lambda much smaller than one. Uh, sorry, excuse me, I've lost track here. So is lambda going to be complexified? Uh, no, no. Lambda will be related to um, y, the imaginary part of tau, which is not complexified. OK, so I'm just looking at the I'm just looking at the zero mode here, the zero instant. Okay. Side. We got it. The X dependence lives in all the higher instanton modes. I think I would have said that that means lambda was complexified by tau, but okay. Okay. Okay, so then the weak coupling expansion is developed in the same way. I'm writing an approximate sign here because I'm just talking about powers, perturbative series. So there is some overall coefficient here. It arises as a residue of the spectral decomposition, of course. And there are positive integer powers of lambda. Uh, lambda tilde here is just lambda over four pi. So I didn't want to write a um, So here, this Rm is a residue function. of what appears in the spectral decomposition. It's a computable residue, provided you have access to the, the genus expansion of the perturbative part. Um, and you can do the exact same thing at strong coupling. So at strong coupling, what do you get? Well, there are a few different features. First, there's a constant term. I'll get to it in a second. Second, uh, there's again. There are perturbative terms. The same residue function, just in a different regime of its argument, so with positive m instead of negative, uh, appears. So there are half integer powers of one over lambda. But there are also these funny uh, positive powers of lambda that come with uh, further suppressions of one over n squared. 
Uh, and these are their existence is implied by SL2Z. This is just the other term in the zero mode of the Eisenstein series, if you want. Um, and in fact, they've appeared in the literature before. Uh, they turn out to be needed for the renormalization of the one over n expansion and strong coupling. And holographically, they're related to uh, the stringy regularization of loop divergences in supergravity. Uh, and I haven't told you what this constant is. It's the ensemble average, but with some extra pieces subtracted off. The note that it starts at down a power compared to the naive genus expansion. Do you understand correctly that uh, these, these terms that have positive lambda, which are related somehow to the UV divergences, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they have coefficients which you can calculate a priori just knowing the perturbative term? That's right. That's right. And they're related in a very simple way to the usual the way the usual strong coupling expansion proceeds. Like it's the same coefficient up to this universal factor. Yeah, you know, like for example, at m equals one and g equals zero, you get root lambda over n squared. Um, and this is just the usual uh, stringy regularization of one loop supergravity by the R to the four term in ADS five times S five. Okay, I'm gonna have to skip. Um, one interesting, one interesting consequence of the general structure of that. Of this de decomposition, and in particular, the fact that the same function appears uh, controls both the weak and strong coupling expansion, just in different regimes of the argument, is that if the weak coupling expansion converges, then it implies uh, non-perturbative effects, uh, both at strong coupling, corresponding to this series being asymptotic, and non removable and also at large n uh, compared to lambda, uh, which is due to this uh, expansion being asymptotic. And that turns out to be implied by the convergence of the weak coupling expansion. Um, and moreover, uh, the strength of the non-perturbative corrections is set by the radius of convergence of the, of the weak coupling expansion. Um, now in n equals four, it turns out that uh, a particular value of the radius of convergence is uh, generic. And that, turn, that implies that these non-perturbative corrections take the form of world sheet instanton effects associated both with fundamental strings and D strings. And they're related, of course, by S duality. Yeah, isn't the weak coupling expansion usually asymptotic for like scaling at fixed, uh, at, it, at fixed n, yes, but often in the weak coupling expansion in the atop limit. Yeah, that's often, uh, turns out to be convergent with some finite radius of convergence. Okay, so that was really fast. We can talk about it after the talk. Um, um, okay, so let's revisit mm -hmm. this general form of the strong coupling expansion. Um, so here, what do we have? We have a constant term, and there are terms that are suppressed either at large lambda or at large n squared. Um, now, uh, this can be simplified a bit. At large n, the average can be written as Sorry. Consider the large n expansion of the average. There's a leading term, which I denote with a double bracket. So we notice it's the same terms here that appear in the subtraction. And what that means is that if you plug that in, then this constant term just becomes the leading part of the average of genus G. So that, that's a kind of remarkable expression. Um, 
So at strong coupling, the only term that survives is the leading part of the average at large n, the leading term of the average. Um, and so what have we learned? Uh, we've learned, we've arrived at the large n equivalence between the supergravity value of the observable and the large n limit uh, of the average. So I'm just going to write at large n. And uh, interestingly, as is basically clear from the form of this expression, uh, this extends to all loop orders in a, in a precise sense. So at G loop, consider the strong coupling limit. And this is just given by the leading part of the average at GSG. Now, of course, the right-hand side is finite. And the left-hand side, if you just compute the supergravity, is not. So it has to be understood to be regularized by these uh, renormalization terms, as I described previously. OK, so this is uh, surprising and intriguing. Um, and obviously, you know, at every point in moduli space, every microscopic instantiation of n equals 4 is still dual to type 2b string theory. Um, nothing I've said has changed that. It's only the uh, strongly coupled theory dual to bulk supergravity that emerges as an ensemble average. Um, and we see that. Sorry, but in bulk supergravity, we have the wave of the D right? Mm -hmm. So we can say that for, for each value of the wave, it's dual to one particular microscope. Uh, that's true. Um, I suppose I mean the, the supergravity value defined as the lambda to infinity limit of the, because the dilaton is just the imaginary part of the tau, right? And here we're considering a scaling where we take, um, we take large n and then we send lambda to infinity. Consider the strong column. Um, Is this also supposed to be true if the overlap with the mass forms is non zero? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And also if the non perturbative part is non zero. And that's essentially, I mean, they, they both enter suppressed at one over n. They don't affect the, uh, this argument. And I have a follow up question. So, in the end of the day, do you have, does your answer depend on the value of the tooth coupling or do you take just the strict limit? No, it does not. It does not. Uh, so this, this is the, it's the value where you take the atop limit, the atop coupling to infinity, all the way to infinity, so that you fill these terms. So your statement is only when lambda equals infinity. Yes. Or are, so the bottom line is that the lambda equals infinity answer from supergravity matches the integral over tau. Um, well, no, because the integral over tau will have no, I mean, this expression, of course, still holds, and these are the corrections from large but finite lambda. Um, but the average doesn't know anything about lambda. The average is just a number. And so it's really the average that provides the lambda to infinity value. Say the point of theory. So to go back to Edward's comment from, from much earlier in the talk, if we have any value of g, and then we hold that fixed, and then we take n to infinity, then we end up with the same lambda goes to infinity limit. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. isn't it just you're taking an average of a load of things that have the same limit and say the limit is the average? Because I think that is one way of thinking about it because it is only it really requires large n to you know be related to supergravity. And yes, I, I, I think that's I guess it. to what extent should we think of this as evidence of like ensemble sort of necessarily showing up in the gravity description, and what extent is it just you, you have a lot of things that have the same limit and things simplify. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that we really understand the answer to that question, honestly. So, so would you say that your average and large n don't compute? Is that the yes, whole, yes, that, that's definitely the point. You have to you have to compute the average first and then take its large n limit. Because the opposite would be true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that, that, that is an essential point, uh, Shai, that the large n limit and the averaging don't compute. Okay, so I'm already over time. I'll try to conclude in a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, I mean, at, at least uh, morally, the picture is that 
Although many other details uh, of the story are very different from what happens in low dimensions, averaging does seem to generate a simple theory in the bulk, namely supergravity. An immediate corollary of this actually is um, that any observable that diverges in the strong coupling limit, so the anomalous dimension of the Kishi is a famous example, that can't be modular. Um, and that makes sense because I didn't expect the anomalous dimension of the Kishi to be a non perturbatively well defined CFT observable. It makes reference to the Lagrangian formulation of the theory. You, can, you could, however, speak of the dimension of the lightest. Uh, you know, SU4 are singlet scalar operator, and that's a well defined notion. And that would be modular invariant. Okay, so I'll just say a few words about statistics. There's one interesting result I want to get to here of statistics uh, in this so called SL2Z ensemble. Um, uh, sorry, I missed it. What was the supergravity? You're saying that the, the limit, the large, the large end limit, and the integration over this non-compact domain don't commute. And that makes a lot of sense. So you're saying that the averaging over tau still has a holographic description. What is this holographic supergravity? Um, it's just the infinite lambda limit of the uh, theory in the, in the atos limit. So the lambda to infinity limit at each order in the genus expansion. So how is it different from the usual supergravity? It's not. That's the point. I think the point is that then why do the limits not commute? I thought <laughs> I, I I thought I had some clarity when you said that the limits didn't commute. Um, uh, the, the comment about the limits not commuting was actually a somewhat technical point about the details uh, of the computation. Uh, it doesn't really affect the schematic picture, I think. So you're just trying to say they didn't have to commute? Because I guess you're trying to say it's like a non-trivial statement. Like it's not just like you take large n, it doesn't depend on tau anyways, and then you average, and it'd be like who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're trying right. to say that like, you know, it, if you do the large n limit, then order by order and one over n, the average isn't even well defined typically. It usually diverges. So it's really important that you compute the average of finite n. There is nothing wrong with the usual interpretation of planar theory, right? Where no. you no. keep lambda fixed but large and then include one over lambda. That's right, that's right. That, that, that fits entirely within this framework. All we're showing is that the leading term is given by the large n limit of the average. Is there really an average here, or is the average just dominated by one point? I think there is really an average here. Um, I gotta say that I don't see how all these statements would be simultaneously consistent. Because uh, there is a dictionary that maps one thing to something else, and now you say it's also mapped to an integral. And yes, we could take limits and so on, but okay. Here, here's maybe what I would say. And in, in the if you if you take the large n limit, uh, say in the atuf limit, fixed lambda, large but finite lambda, say. Um, if you try to, I don't even know how to speak of averages at each order in one over n because the the observable that appears at each order doesn't have to be modular invariant. It's a function of lambda, not tau. So I don't even know how to define the average. Uh, at each order, say, and one over n. I, I, think, I think the central point is that um, in the large n limit, uh, as long as the top coupling is large, you have gravity. Yeah. And the gravity answer is independent. It answers for this observable exactly. are independent of tau. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, and since in most of the place you have something independent of tau, that answer will be equal to the average. I think that's the central point. Right? I mean, sure, they're both constant, uh, for sure. Um, they didn't have to agree a priori. No, I think they had to agree a priori because the, the as long as the average is well defined, you you only might have some contribution at the very tips that are. Yeah, maybe what you're saying, as long as the Atuft expansion is well defined, the strong coupling expansion is well defined. Yeah, I'm talking about the leading term, let's say. Yeah, 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 exactly. As long as everything else is suppressed at strong coupling, then 
uh, enforceability in terms, as you say, there are these diversion terms, which, uh, well, yeah, yeah, requires some stuff. I mean, that's not trivial. Yeah, yeah. In principle, string theory should make everything fine. Well, that is, that is what these uh, renormalization terms are doing at fixed orders and one over n, strong coupling limit. They represent this stringy regularizations to supergravity, um, and they show up here. Okay, um, I'm way over time. I'm just going to write one more equation on the board. Um, so you can compute the variance of these observables over the conformal manifold. Uh, it's straightforward. Um, and you can consider the variance in a large n limit. And uh, interestingly and puzzlingly, it, it's down by a single power of one over n. This is really puzzling. Um, you know, it, it, if you really, if you think that the variance should correspond to some connected configuration in the bulk because it, uh, it correlates multiple copies, um, then you would expect a non-perturbative suppression. Remember, n squared is like one over g. Um, but on the other hand, it's not perturbative in g newton either. So it, this is really confusing, and we don't really understand what's going on holographically here. Um, and also, oh, I didn't actually. Okay, I'll just say it in words. Um, also, the one over n expansion is asymptotic and uh, receives non perturbative corrections, which have the scale. Which is also possible. Okay, so there's lots more to be said, but I'll, I'll leave it at that and we can chat after the talk. Um, so obviously, future directions, it would be great to understand whether there's any version of this that generalizes to other backgrounds of string theory um, involving automorphic averages and strongly coupled limits, and ensemble averages. Uh, there's a lot to uh, try and understand there. It'd be great to have more data to look at other observables, other integrated correlators, unintegrated correlators, um, thermal observables that are particularly sensitive to the statistics of high energy states, um, and also to look at deformations like 40n equals 2 at super QCD. Um, obviously, the holographic and semi classical interpretation of these facts is pretty confusing, um, and that deserves to be understood better. And same goes for the, the non perturbative effects that I described earlier in words. It'd be great to combine the spectral technology with other techniques like bootstrap, imagine bootstrapping in spectral space. Uh, and finally, it would be great to draw a connection between the presence of the cusp forms and their arithmetic chaos and more conventional notions of chaos in N equals four. Um, so thanks. We have some time for a few questions. Yeah, so um, well, one thing I was confused about is that so your constant term is n times n minus one, right? The times the number for the for the integrated correlator uh, of you guys and yeah, your... yeah but, but, but whereas like if you just take the large n limit of that correlator, the leading term um, it goes like n squared, like not n n times one. That's reflecting the fact that the average and the averaging and the large n limit don't. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so I thought that was actually a good you know example of that. That it's like not totally trivial. That that's right. Trivial. That's right. They're not. Like it, one's n times m minus one, one's n squared. And I'm also just wondering if you have some explanation of why, like, why do you have that? Well, it's it's this mechanism here. Uh, so this is I'm expanding the average at large n. Here's the leading term, which is like n squared in this uh, integrated correlator. Yeah. But there are also these subleading terms, which are down by a power at each chance. Is, um, there, is there any significance that it's specifically n minus one times n? So like relative system. Yeah, no, not that I not that I'm aware of. It just follows from. It's inherited from the structure of these parts of the overlap. But yeah, why it had to be n minus one. I don't think it's true for the other observe the other integrated correlator, for example. Yep. If you think about the n equal four theory as an n equal one theory, there are more exactly marginal deformations that would break n equal four but preserve n equal one. So if I then average over the n equal one conformal manifold, would you expect to get the same answer? That's a great question. I, we don't know. Um, um, yeah, that's the short answer. Um, you know, in, in more general settings, like I was imagine, I was discussing possible generalizations to other string theory backgrounds. That 
you know, the moduli space, uh, the dimension of the conformal manifold is often bigger than one complex dimension. And, and you could imagine that only one direction really localizes you onto the strongly coupled theory. So should you only average over that direction or do you average over all of it? And yeah, we, we don't know, honestly. Um, but it's definitely of interest to explore. So I had a question related to that. So um, what is actually known about the Zamologikov metric for, uh, I don't know, say SU2n equals four or for class S more general? Yeah, I think some, uh, some so for 40n equals two super QCD, um, NF equals two N, I believe uh, the Zamologikov metric can be, it's one of these extremal correlators that can be computed from localization and some perturbative and non-perturbative information is known, but uh, I don't think there are any candidates for exact expressions. Um, but, but it does limit, but with the, that information, you should be able to say if it's finite volume. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and that's on our to-do list uh, specifically for those 40 and 40 and equals two super QCD theories, but we haven't, we haven't looked at it explicitly, explicitly yet. Okay, no further questions. This time, it's called for three talks.